All right, Mr. Donovan, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, yeah, so I, I found out about your, uh, your work about six months ago, and it was really interesting um, reading it in 2020, given the state of the world, the pandemic, the racial stuff in America. I, I was wondering, first off, if any part of you was delighted or um, maybe hoping of a societal breakdown, if only to vindicate your ideas? I hate being right. And basically, <laughs> I hate being right. I mean, the cover of The Way of Men has people wearing masks, you know, like, it has the gators. Right. Um, it's a little spooky. Uh, it feels very 2020, right? You know, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there, people were sending me passages, like readers sending me passages from the book constantly, like, oh my God, oh my God. In one of the, one of the books, it might have been The Way of Men, or it might have been one of the other ones, I, I mentioned a Chinese flu as one of the, the things for the end of the world. Uh, so yeah. there's stuff that uh, I, I feel like I've been a little too right about, if anything. I'm not yeah. excited about it. Uh, you know, I'd rather, you know, uh, I, I wrote that book maybe when I was an angry truck driver. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I have you know, good things in life right now. I'd really not like the world to fall apart. Uh, but I understand some reasons why it should. You know, like, uh, you know, there, there's still... The, the, pro the same problems I was talking about the way of men are still there and they're actually worse. So it's, it's worse that, you know, if it has to happen, it has to happen. Yeah. It was interesting. Cause um, you know, like when I, I was stocking up for food in March um, you know, when it seemed like there might be a food shortage, I live in Thailand, I have a machete for opening, opening coconuts. And I'm like, Oh shit, I might have to use this for something else, which is something I've romanticized since Mad Max came out, but I don't know that I want to, like, <laughs> you know, Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot of guys have a fantasy about what the end of the world is going to be like and how they're going to be warlords or Mad Max guys or whatever. And uh, I don't have any fantasies about that. I, I've met the guys who can do that job, and I'm not at their level. Uh, and so, and most guys are not at their level. You're not going to be a warlord. Uh, the, the end of the world to me looks like I have to shoot my dogs and fight over cans of beans. <laughs> You know, like that's, it's not that, that cool. If it has to happen, it has to happen, but uh, it's not, uh, it's not gonna be cool. It's not gonna be exciting, you know. I mean, it will be for some people who probably have been waiting for this all their lives, but uh, you know, I'm not one of them. Gotcha. But on the other end of things, I mean, especially years ago when you wrote The Way of Men, this is all hypothetical or more hypothetical. Uh, you recognize what a lot of people recognize, which is that there is something being lost as far as male expression. There's some aspects of testosterone virtues that are obsolete. Um, so could you maybe share like the, the trade-off, I guess, that, that comes with that and like the tactical virtues? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's actually a chapter, I think, towards the end of The Way of Men. It talks about the trade-off uh, where masculinity is checked to civilization and uh, civilization is a check to masculinity and there's this balance that we've always had and it's always been a struggle uh, you know i think i cited the, the epic of gilgamesh and you have uh, gilgamesh complaining that people in the city are soft and uh you know getting mad about it and uh you know, these are the same discussions that we have today uh there's a sweet spot i think and uh, i think we're past the sweet spot where you have very few men uh get to really realize a lot more of their potential. Uh, I don't think an ideal is that we are all, uh, you know, what Hobbes called the war of all against all, uh, where people are constantly fighting each other. Uh, but uh, that does have to be on the table. I think uh, for men to realize themselves, they have to have some kind of agency. Uh, and yeah, that is being lost in a world that is very, very safe. And very, very protected. You have a very small percentage of men who are allowed to do the job that men have all always had to do. I mean, even if you were a farmer, you still had to protect your farm. And you mm -hmm. still had to roll at the edge of the your perimeter of your land or whatever. But, uh, you know, we are, weren't all warriors ever. That was not ever the case. But, uh, you know, that is, that is part of being a man. And I think that uh, when all you have to do is sit in your house and play video games, uh, yeah, that is, you are losing something. What do you say to the guys, I'm sure you get this argument all the time, uh, like if, if uh, masculine virtues really are obsolete, like let's say the United States stays uh, in perfect order, the police do what they're supposed to do, you don't have to actually take on those roles. 
why should a guy invest in something that's not needed and also inconvenient? Well, for the same reason that you probably still want to have sex. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, most people want to have sex, but they aren't planning on having children. It's not necessary. It's not logical. It's actually a huge waste of resources and time uh, to go and have sex. But it's something your primal brain wants to do anyway. It is part of being the animal that we are. And when people talk about evolution, uh, you know, it's like, that, that doesn't mean, I don't think it means what you think it means. You know, evolution happens very slowly. And uh, when people were saying, well, we just just evolved past that. Well, you're looking at like the industrial revolution, like talking about a couple hundred years uh, that this situation, we're not going to evolve to adapt to that that quickly. And uh, so, yes, I mean, I, this is the reason why I think, you know, a, an expression of this in peacetime has always been sports. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always played sports. And this kind of takes some of that, that energy and that thing that men need to do and gives them an outlet for it that's productive. And, uh, but you know, you're getting to the point where people are doing less and less contact sports, less and less of any of these things. And it, sports, that's, that's the kind of thing that's generally been what men did when they're not in the world. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in the 90s and I remember when I was a kid and they, took away recess because kids were falling down and skinning their knees. And like, that was almost like the beginning of atrophy of masculinity or like toughness in my generation, I feel like. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, again, that's what kids need to do. That's what men need to do still. I mean, yeah. uh, I yeah, I've talked to uh, uh, actually a guy, I had, had him over uh, to my uh, office here and I have some mats uh, where we can do uh, grappling and jujitsu and so forth. And, uh, he was over the other day and uh, he said, you know, if he gets to do jujitsu and go and strangle people and, and try and break their arms, then uh, he's really chill at work. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, everybody's <laughs> aggro and insane about their jobs. And he's like, I can be chill at work because I have this other thing uh, where I get all that energy out and where I uh, have to have a real problem. He's a, I think he said that. Uh, uh, you know, if someone's trying to choke you out, that's a real problem. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Being a little bit angry about something that Flo said, uh, you know, is is not a real problem. So it's a, it's a different situation. Yeah. I mean, in jiu-jitsu, you get to simulate death every every class, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, why, why bother with this other nonsense on social media? Maybe you don't want to move exactly at that moment. You know, uh, you know it's, yeah. it's, uh, but, you know, it's like, maybe I don't want to do another round. But the other guy does, so I'm going to, and I'm going to force mm -hmm. myself. To do it. That's that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I found really validating about the tactical virtues you mentioned, honor, courage, strength, mastery, was that for my whole life I've had disdain for certain guys for some reason. I didn't know why, and I thought I was the asshole. I just thought I was an asshole. Like, why am I judging these guys? But you did uh, you did point out like there's a real evolutionary reason, like if zombies attack or I forget what other examples you mentioned. And I found it really useful uh, of like understanding why I judge certain guys for certain things. Um, and I, I was, uh, I don't know if I have a, a clear question here, but like, I guess, how did you come up with those four specifically over the many positive virtues a guy could have? Well, there are a lot of virtues that you could have. And, and virtue is a funny word actually, because it actually comes from the word that means man. Yeah, uh, so I didn't know that <laughs> until, until your book. The European uh, word, but uh, and it becomes dear, which man, is man, and it becomes uh, virtue eventually. But um, so it's kind of always virtue has always been manliness, but then it's expanded in a civilized society to mean a lot of things. And and you know, women have virtues too. There are virtues that are just human virtues. Uh, compassion is a human virtue. It has nothing to do specifically with masculinity. It has it's just a human virtue. And uh, so. What I look for in the way of men with strength, courage, mastery, and honor are things that are always specific to masculinity. It doesn't mean that women can't have them. It means that men expect other men to have them. It's like that's what men expect out of other men it is, it, it, you know, it defines what makes them masculine or not. Mm -hmm. and so it was really a logic problem. A lot of people think that, you know, like I was in the military or something like that, and I came up with these from that kind of stuff. And, and really, no, it was a philosophical problem. Like, what is, 
Yeah, strength is easy because strength is actually, we are biologically stronger. That is something that makes us more masculine. It's not when, like women can't be strong, but on the far end of the spectrum, we are strong, the big curves. And so that's, that's obviously part of masculinity. It always has been. And uh, you know, courage is something that men needed from each other in emergencies and that you know, women really needed men to have courage too, to protect them. And we've always had that. And uh, all throughout history, find me a culture where they say, you know that, that guy who's cowering in the corner over there? He's <laughs> the most masculine guy in this room. I mean, it's, it doesn't happen. It is a universal in terms of how men judge each other as men uh, in, in the big strokes of uh, successful cultures. Uh, we expect men to be strong. We expect them to be, we expect them to be competent. And, uh, you know, there's a thing. Girls, have, girls and women, they have, they have a different value to men than men do. You know, they, if a girl's cute and goes, I don't know, like, if she's hot, that's fine. That men still value, she has a value to men all of her own. Uh, if a dude says, I don't know, he's, he's what good is he? <laughs> you know, it's a different, we judge men differently than we judge women because we want them for different things. You know, and, yeah. and so you know, women don't always have to be competent. They certainly can be, uh, but men don't demand that from them always. Yeah. And so that was master. You know, like that men, men really appreciate when another man is really good at something and they kind of expect them to do at least be confident. So, and then honor, I think was, a uh, honor, the basic, uh, the basic definition of honor is, is that, you know, you care about the men around you's opinion, and you, the, the men in your honor group, uh, whether it's your, your zombie team or, or whether, you know, it's your a broader society. Uh, it means caring about what those men think of you. And uh, you, know, you respect them and they respect you and you demonstrate that back and forth. And that's important to you because if those men don't respect you, I mean, you're depending on them for security. And they're depending on you for security. So if you say, and this is something I talked about in the book, uh, if you say you don't care what, about what these guys think about you, understand that they shouldn't care about what you know you think about them. Either. Mm-hmm. You know, like they, they it's gonna be reciprocal. So and a lot of people don't understand that. If you're like, I don't value the things that you value, look, I'm so special. And uh, they're like, well, you don't value the things that we value, why should we value the things that you value? Yeah. And uh, it's it important in the book I call that like flamboyant dishonor. Uh, because you know, you're going you're you're proud of the fact that you don't care about what these guys think. And uh, that becomes an issue for a lot of men. And a lot of men, they don't even know they're, it's, it's an honor thing. They're reacting to it. You know, when you see a guy who is being openly effeminate, uh, it just bugs guys to be around him. And it's not because they're scared of him. That's a, that's a kind of a propaganda thing. They're not scared of that guy. They're just like, mm, uh, you're, in, in the way that I'm embarrassed for people on television, you know, it, it, like when they when they do something ridiculous, like I, you know, you watch the reality television show, like why is that lady crying for because she didn't make a cake? You know, it's like, oh, right. Why? You know, it's painful to watch. You know, and I think that that it just it's disgusting a little bit, and, and I think a lot of the men respond to really effeminate men in that way. Uh, they're just like, well, why would you not want to look strong? That's you know, it, it, it's a it's kind of a mind fuck for them. Yeah, honor's the one I thought about the most because like. I, oh, hold on, my mic just dropped. Um, it, well, honestly, the one I, I thought about the most because I didn't really get why I judge a guy if he doesn't like, if he says he's going to go to the gym and he doesn't, like, it doesn't really affect me. But why do I, like, why do I give a shit? Until I read that part in your book, I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, it comes down to, like, being able to count on him. And then I also noticed that um, I don't hold women to that standard at all. I don't care if women change their mind. It doesn't even bug me at all. But then I also thought, I thought about the word flamboyancy because I've asked a lot of gay guys, what's the deal with like the limp wrist or the gay voice? Like, it doesn't make sense to me evolutionarily why that exists. And I don't know if you said this in your book directly, but it kind of made sense. Like it is signaling, like if you have a limp wrist, you can't hold a sword. So we're not going to count on you when the zombies come. I was like, oh, I finally get it now. <laughs> like, right. And that's, that's actually a problem that I, one of the ways that I figured out some of the tactical virtues was I went backwards. 
uh, if you look at a man who every other man think is really offended, what is he doing wrong? Like, why is he, what signals is he sending that's making him think he's not as masculine as they are? And usually they're symbols of open submission. Mm -hmm. you know, and that, you know, if you're just let me, you're like, you, you're, yeah, you're not going to, you're, you're slouching. You know, you're like, uh, uh, you don't care about stuff. You're, 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 you're like, you don't look like someone that he wants to take seriously. And he, mm -hmm. so you're signaling that kind of, you know, flamboyant dishonor that like, I don't care if you think that I'm strong. And uh, that's, and so yeah, like, yeah, like I said, a lot of these things were reverse engineered. Like, let's look at that, the least masculine guy in the room that everyone agrees is the least masculine guy. And then let's figure out why, you know? So, so went both. Cool. So I want to bring this into, uh, you say the way of men is the way of the gang, which is perhaps one of the more controversial statements, but it made sense. And I, I was wondering, actually, can you explain that first before anything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I was, I was messing with people a little bit, uh, you know, because that, that sounds like a bad thing. Uh, but it is a gang. I mean, uh, the most primitive group of men, you know, it's like two guys, two, three guys who then are working together. You know, like they're devoting to each other. They're working to survive together. That's a gang. I mean, it's a, and uh, I think I got it also from uh, uh, this book, uh, Demonic Males. And they talk about uh, chimpanzees and, and uh, humans as being, having a party gang structure. Whereas, you know, they're, they're, their smallest unit is, is a really tight you know, gang. And then depending on resources and threats and outside factors, they can expand to a really big group, but if they feel threatened, they're going to go get into a smaller group uh, because mm -hmm. smaller groups are more nimble and they're, they're you know, like uh, you can really count on those guys, but like you can't count on 300, 400 people necessarily. You can't even really know them. You, it's, it, you may not be able to remember all their names, uh, but those three or four guys, you feel like you can count on them. That's a security thing. Mm -hmm. And could you share a little bit about like how, I mean, like the term men's group is really popular in like the personal development world. I mean, guys are trying to get together, but like none of us have to hunt. So we don't have to work together to take down animals. Like there's very, there's few functions for why guys have to organize. And most masculine guys don't want to just sit in a circle talking about their feelings. Like, what do you recommend to people of finding that, you know, monarbun type situation? Well, I mean, that's, you're exactly right. Uh, men don't want to sit around and uh, have the same kind of group that women have. And there's a lot of guys who try to do that. And again, it's kind of embarrassing to watch. It's, it's like, that's not, that's not right. Uh, and most men who are more masculine don't feel comfortable in a group like that. Um, unless a lot, you, know, you have this weird exception of the rule where you have guys who have already done all the most masculine things in the world. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of like novel and new to them. They're like, oh, well, I've been killing people for 10 years, but okay, let's talk about our feelings. You know, and so it becomes like novel to them. But uh, to most guys, that's very uncomfortable. And, you know, but men will bond really well if they're just, you know, taking a hike together and talking about stuff. And, uh, you know, because it's, you know, it's a more shoulder to shoulder. And uh, it's it, rather than like, you know, immediate sharing. Yeah, you know, women will like share openly, you know, just sitting down meeting a stranger almost. And men, men will hold that back because again, it's a tactical thing. They're like, why would I tell everyone all my weaknesses? Or, I just met you five minutes ago. That, that's, a, that's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the things that uh, men really need to do to create those kind of bonds is, yeah, they have to do, do something together. Uh, the guy who came up with the word, uh, the phrase male bonding, his name is Glenn O'Connor, and in a book called Men in Groups. And you know, he says something to the effect that uh, men need to aggress against something. Hmm. And that could be building something. You know, they're aggressing against nature. They're aggressing against, they have this project. They're doing this thing that is creating drama in some kind of way. Uh, so they could be building something, or they could be fighting each other in some way. Uh, I think you know, grappling is a really good way uh, you know, to jitsu. It's something I encourage a lot of guys to get into because striking is, is kind of a level up. Yeah. Uh, I've, done, I've done some boxing, uh, but that's you know, 
getting uh, knocked down it is pretty uh, embarrassing, you know, for yeah. most people. And they're not going to your brain. <laughs> yeah, that's not like a day one, week one kind of thing. You know, like they're not ready for that. Most guys are not ready for that. And, and that's going to keep a lot of guys away. But, you know, like I roll with guys in jiu-jitsu all the time. And it's like, okay, you, you tap and it's like, it's not, I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> you know, it's not, I wasn't shamed in front of a group of people. It's like, oh, I lost that round. Okay, I'll try, try to do better. And so mm-hmm. you're still getting that, uh, that competition and that, uh, that interaction with men in, in the way that men interact well. But you're not uh, creating a situation that is going to like alienate a bunch of guys who are really not comfortable with that yet. Because uh, yeah. not everyone can get punched in the face, you know, every, every day. You know, right. uh, they're just not ready yet. That, that's, you know, that's something they have to work up to. But to just start out, I mean, a lot of guys have never been in an aggressive situation at all. And they've had never had anything like that. So, you know, baby steps. <laughs> and so like grappling, like, grappling, I think is a, is a good way uh, to get there. And, you know, you'll find that, you know, you end up rolling with some guys or whatever. And, and uh, in between rounds, you, you start talking. And then that's really natural. And that's, that's the way men interact. They'll talk about that, but then they'll talk, end up talking about something. They'll talk about you know, what move you used or whatever. And then they'll kind of seg out into some other topic. And it's, so it's, it's very authentic and natural and yeah. not kind of staged sharing of feelings that people try to do. Yeah. And everyone's ego becomes flat. You know, it's cl- very clear who beat whom. So there's no reason to, you know, like all the, the chest puffing up goes away usually. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just get rid of that. It's, it's, yeah. it, doesn't, like, uh, I, it doesn't matter how cool I look on Instagram. If, it, you know, like you tap me or you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to jump ahead to, because uh, you mentioned the feelings talk, and I, I was curious what you thought about like Jung's concept of the anima, like a man's feminine side, um, because you did mention uh, the super masculine guy talking about his feelings. No one really bats an eye at that. Like the, the actual, the actual war hero, there's something cool or okay about that. Or like the samurai would like talk about going into their yin side and painting. I, I'm curious, just your general thoughts on like a man's feminine side and cultivating that if it's important or, or what? Um, you know, to quote Fight Club, where a generation of men raised by women, I, 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 I think what a woman is <laughs> exactly the thing that we need. Uh, and, and honestly, yeah, you have, uh, most men are taught, you know, by women in school. Uh, they're inundated with uh, images of uh, heroic females and, and uh, you know, the woman who is better than the man, and the, the mom who is better than the dad. And... Uh, and they've, been, they've gotten all this programming about how fantastic women are. And uh, they're really living in a feminine world. So, you know, to, to someone like uh, Young, you know, like uh, 150 years ago or whatever, uh, that, you know, might have seemed really novel for men to explore their feminine side mm-hmm. because he's still lived in a very patriarchal society uh, where men had all the political power. Uh, and uh, you know, dominate every aspect of society. But men are probably too in touch with their feminine side already, like ninety yeah. percent. The only, the only, the only issue, and I don't even like to say that you have a feminine side because where is that? Are we really women inside somewhere? And I mean, that's just a, it's a model that Jung made up. I mean, it's not like a physical reality. Uh, there isn't a actually. You can't find like anatomically where is the feminine side. It's just, it's a model for the way we see the world. And I was saying, you know, if you're a man, you had this set of chromosomes and you've been a man since the beginning. And uh, you don't, we really don't know what it is to be women. We really don't know what their experience is. We have, we can, we can kind of guess what they might feel like, what it might feel like to be a girl, but we don't know. We're, we're just kind of projecting our our idea of what that is in the same way that you know you know they say that we can't they say that we can't understand their experience or they, people say you can't understand experience of someone who's a different race or what they go through or whatever uh, you know we really can't understand uh, what it means to be a woman so your idea of a feminine side is really your caricature of a woman because you can't be you can't actually understand mm-hmm. what so I don't, know, I, I, I don't think it's helpful in most cases. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've taken it to mean like your oxytocin receptors. If we could like identify it in the body, it's like whatever makes you think things are cute, that is your girl side. Um, <laughs> Um, but, uh, but I mean, I've, I've, I have a lot of female friends in their late thirties, early forties who've dated millennials and generation X. And they all say it's great how millennials are so empathic, but they're boring as fuck. And like, that's like what every woman says. And you know, yeah. I mean, you can't argue with that. Yeah. I think I had a girl in, uh, in, uh, Portland say something, was, she called it mumble core or something mm-hmm. like, like, you know, dating him was like, Oh, do you, do you want to have sex? Oh, do you want to have sex? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cool. Hold on. I, I jumped all over the place. So let me just, uh, we skipped over honor. Um, well, sorry. So I'll just, just go to something else. I, I want to ask you about male mythologies. Cause I, I think I, I read somewhere, uh, Chuck Palahniuk had a quote about you. some some praising quote. And I, I was really moved by his, um, he said something on Joe Rogan about men not having male mythologies anymore. Like there's fight club and like, that's it. Like women have a million things in, in Hollywood to look at as models for women there's not a lot for men. And I was wondering what you thought about that and why that is given that Hollywood should try to serve the market, right? There's men who want certain things, but like we're, it's still missing from our contemporary mythology. I was wondering why you thought that was and like what men can do about it. Well, I mean, we do. I mean, they are chipping away at it and there's an agenda there. And it's very open at this point. Uh, that they don't want men to be a certain way, so they're kind of trying to reprogram them through Hollywood. But, I mean, superhero movies are mostly, I mean, Tony Stark. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I think I just watched the Avengers, right? That's why it popped into my head. Uh, you know, James Bond, superhero movies. Men do have the thought that, you know, that these characters are, are that, that is our myth. You know, th- those are our myths. Uh, I mean, what, you know, little boys in their head they want to be, you know, Luke Skywalker or this magical uh, you know, guy with superhero powers or whatever. And they imagine being that guy. And that, that's what myth is. You know, you imagine what that person is like. That's, you know, uh, you look at Superman. Superman actually is one of my favorites now. He used to be, I used to think he was boring. And uh, now he's one of my favorites because he fills so many things that relate to, like, mythological structure in terms of, like, uh, Hercules or, or whatever he needs. He's like, a, you know, just, ancient heroes are always kind of part orphan. You know, they always mm-hmm. come from somewhere else because their their father is a god. And that's kind of the same thing with Superman. He's like, he comes from somewhere else, but like he's there to help people. I mean, it's, it's very, it's very much along the lines of like uh, Heracles. And mm-hmm. so, you know, those are myths today. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm working on now is uh, you know, all of the myths of all history are really our uh, heritage mm-hmm. as men. Uh, you know, they, there's this idea of the hero that hasn't gone away, this idea of a warrior that has been with us forever. We have all of those stories. And the important thing, I think, is to reconnect with all of them. Uh, and then they come into very clear patterns. Uh, the book that I'm working, right, working on right now uh, has three main archetypes. It's, kind of, it's a little bit like King, Magician, Warrior, Lover, uh, but put it down in more to a tripartite system because a lot of uh, comparative mythologists and so forth have done that in the past. And I like that system a little bit better. But uh, I mean, cultures all around the world that have had no contact with each other uh, come up with the idea of a sky father. Mm-hmm. You know, this father in the sky who looks down and creates order and uh, you know, basically determines what's right and wrong. And that, that becomes kind of a king archetype, but really it's this father archetype. It's what we look up to. It's kind of our ideal of what a man is at, at the highest possible level. And then you know, below that, there's usually some kind of a figure that's a warrior. You know, because that mm. you create order and then you have to protect it. And so, uh, you know, there's a word for it in the uh, Proto-European, it's a uh, hepnos, it, it means striker. And um, so that, you know, they always come with thunder and lightning like Thor, uh, you know, in, in the Vedic uh, literature, there's Indra, there's always uh, someone like that out there. And uh, you know, some kind of warrior figure. And again, all of those are all of our heritage. Uh, this, this warrior idea. 
And the same thing, you know, obviously there's always some kind of fertility god. You know, whether it's like kind of the mischievous kind, like uh, the pastoral gods, like Pan, uh, shown in, in the, the Vedic stuff, uh, you know, the, these figures, it's Frey in the, in the Germanic literature. And there's always kind of like this guy that is a little bit more grounded, a little closer to nature, a little closer to, to women. Uh, and you know, that's all part of, you know, it deals with farm animals and so forth. And that's, mm-hmm. that's all part of our life too, because we're, we're from the earth. You know, whether we, we want to look up to the sky, but we are from the earth and we have to deal with physical reality in this world. And we have to deal with women, and, and so there's always this kind of so this, this kind of transitional figure there, um, and so so I think reconnecting with that is really important. And uh, people like to rely on science for everything, but science really doesn't. You know, no one thinks about like ah, oh, science can't create uh, a Heracles. <laughs> it, 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 can, it can create a lot of things, and it can solve a lot of problems, and it can do a lot of math. Uh, but uh, it can't create a hair. It can't create a, a dream. Right. And dreams are an important part of our reality. And uh, that's that's our unconscious world. And so we need something that taps into that. And that's why we watch movies, and that's why we have comic books, and we have all these things. Right. But I think that you know we need to you know, reconnect with those uh, kind of ancient ideals uh, because they inspire us to be better. Men. Right. More complete. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I got to look at the Marvel movies again because I get frustrated. I thought you were going to say something different about superhero movies because I find them to like only look at one side. They almost have like a monotheistic structure. We'll actually ask you about it in a second, but like I get frustrated seeing how Marvel puts out the same exact plot structure over and over again and then everyone watches it like drones, like a brave new world. It might just be me though. <laughs> I, mean, well, um, I mean, I've gotten kind of bored with them. I mean, it's like they go too far with it, right? They're always like, yeah. Why do we have to save the universe every time? It's always about the, the whole universe. They have to be kind of ridiculous. Like there's always, uh, it's like, uh, can you just solve a problem? <laughs> can you have one like villain, you know, not just like, right. like an army of villains coming from outer space. You know, it's always, it's always a little bit too much, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, all right. So th- one of the things I loved about your third book was that you were speaking about the chthonic side of things and like, uh, as opposed to like the monotheistic structure of like good and evil being absolute, you're kind of like about, I mean, my interpretation at least was you're accepting everything, like the beast parts of you, the dark parts of you, the parts of society uh, cuts out. Um, I mean, is that, is that a fair interpretation? Well, I mean, you have to understand, you have to be self-aware. Uh, you know, I have to know what, you know, what Jung would call a shadow. Uh, I have to know what my shadow wants to make sure that he's not in charge. <laughs> you know, I, I have to be honest with myself about like, uh, well, if I went too far down this road, I would turn into this guy and that's not who I want to be. So I have to create a wall there. And I guess a lot of people aren't self-aware, so they have to explore that uh, actively. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've always been pretty self-aware. I know exactly what I would do <laughs> if, if I just, we're like, fuck it, let's go. Who cares about my reputation or anything or what my legacy? I just want to have fun. Uh, you know, like what dark path would I go down? I mean, I have a pretty good idea of, of what that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot, a lot of people just don't acknowledge that that's there. And I think that you do have to be self-aware and acknowledge what's there, but also make choices about you don't have to do something just because you want to and you are able to. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that's why I like the term idealism. Uh, and calling the philosophy that I'm working on right now solar idealism in the sense that you it's like yeah we have all these aspects of ourselves but what's best what we, who do you really want to be you know I had a guy uh, the other day who's really successful on, with a lot of things online and uh, you know he, he does a little bit more of a reality show game you know a little bit more like you know uh you know, bears his soul and does, you know, it puts things out there and people like that and they respond to it. And you can get real famous doing that. And I'm like, that's not who I want to be. I can do it. I have good stories. I can go crazy. Uh, but uh, that's not exactly who I want to be. And so, you know, yeah, then I was like, nah, I'm going to make the choice. What's my idea? First, who do I want to be? I don't, I don't care that he does that. It doesn't bother me. Uh, good for him. But uh, me personally, who do I want to be? 
And I think we always have to make those choices. And a lot of people respond negatively to, because, you know, we have this Christian structure or morality, like good and evil, uh, that comes from a very old book, very long time ago. And some of those th things are good ideas and they, they're, they were in the book because of, for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're things that have always worked. Uh, and other things are pretty, ar seem very arbitrary in 2020. Mm -hmm. They don't really address the problems of our time necessarily. So, uh, you know, a lot of people have a really negative reaction to that kind of stuff. I mean, I do think, I do think that you, there is evil in the world. And I, maybe I wouldn't have said that a few years ago, but uh, okay. I feel like I've seen a lot of it this year. <laughs> and <laughs> we're doing bad things. And, uh, and it's you know, like hurting way more people than they ever should. And, uh, and I, so I think that is, is there, there is a good and evil, uh, I think, uh, but the, it, the lines are a little blurrier than people like to, to believe. Yeah, because like one of the, I think it was in your third book, you, you shared a, a quote or an equation, I think it was from Nietzsche, like uh, good equals strength equals something equals beauty equals what the gods want or something. Yeah, which, yeah. which I think you tie to like subjective, subject, like good is subjective to you, right? I mean, because like the people that you're mentioning doing all this close subjective evil, they probably don't think it's evil, right? Well, we're, people are really good at rationalizing whatever they do. There's this line from the movie, I think the talented Mr. Ripley, like it says, no, no matter what anyone does, they don't really think they're a bad person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's true. I, I do think there is a little bit of some kind of an objective, uh, you know, it's a, somewhat kind of objective reality. I mean, uh, a lot of that is subjective. And, and, and I do believe that, you know, you can't, you can't please everyone. And I have always been a fan of tribalism. Like you can't, you can't help the whole world at once mm -hmm. like you have to take care of a group a, a some kind of defined group and then because taking care of the whole world is too many variables and it's too big for any one person to do and usually when people try to do that they, that's when that's when the evil happens <laughs> you mm -hmm. know it's like yeah. you're trying to change the world to an extent that, you know where you can't actually control all the variables and you're going to do some bad things uh but uh you know if you're trying to to really take care of your community. Uh, maybe the community next next town over might not do so well, you mm -hmm. know, but that's on them. You know, like everybody has to try and survive. And I think that's that's kind of what Nietzsche was uh, getting at with that. You know, like we have to, you know, the will to power. We have to like try to succeed in the world and try and be the best that we can be. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think there are certain Kind of, kind of limits to how far you can go. And usually, usually historically, you know, the Greeks call it hubris. I mean, historically, that's people usually fall on their face when they try and do that. I mean, mm -hmm. they, it doesn't last very long. You know, Rome wanted to rule the whole world and it just and it fell apart. And uh, you know, obviously the Germans gave, gave a good try of that. He, look at England, England's a mess now. Like, it, mm -hmm. it, like the sun never set on the British empire for a minute, <laughs> you know, for a hot yeah. minute. <laughs> You know, let's say Alexander the Great tried to do it. Uh, you know, people, it's like, that's when you're getting a little big for your britches, probably. You know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Bill Gates of the world are probably a little big for the britches right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, back in March, especially when COVID was hitting, I kept thinking about the Bronze Age collapse and how Egypt was so far ahead of everyone. And then three things happened. I think it was a drought, an invasion and something. And then it was gone. And uh, I was like, oh, shit, what if this happens to the United States? Like, that would, that would suck. <laughs> but I guess it's possible. Uh, we're, we're kind of at our, you know, at the, you know, the sell-by date or whatever for, for big civilizations, you know, like as far as for big superpowers have about a 200 year, two, 300 year span that they usually uh, can hold on to things and then, you know, something else comes into play, you know, something else happens. I mean, I, I, you know, Egypt was around for forever, you know, mm -hmm. thousands of years, ago, but uh uh, generally speaking, I mean, to have that, that big scope uh, and be number one, that doesn't really last that long, generally. And that, and that was actually, I've, I've been really into George Washington really recently, and uh, 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 even at the time when he, uh, when the United States was being created, uh, George Washington, a lot of people were being like, a country can't be this big. 
mm -hmm. know, especially when they're like, you know, they, if they were expanding out, you know, into the going west and so forth, they're like a country champion is big. This is too big for one thing to be. And uh, and he's like, yeah, it, George Washington was like, he, he, he you know, was a dreamer, and he's like, let's see, <laughs> let's give it a chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I I think it's too big. You know, it probably needs to get broken up. Uh, yeah, but uh, who, who knows if that'll happen? But uh, yeah. yeah but that's kind of, I mean, uh, like, let's say that it went the other way. Let's say the states were actually the nations and like there was 50 little nations. Uh, America wouldn't be a superpower then. It would be like every state would have its own military and collectively they would not be very strong. Like it's kind of like, what do you do about that trade-off? Right. That, that was George Washington's thing is that, uh, you know, like if, if the colonies just became individual colony of the countries, then uh, the first foreign power that wants to pick them off can just do right. it. But that's also why people have allies. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, I mean, that's, I mean, Europe has a whole bunch of little countries and you know, I think they overshot it with the European Union. That's still too, that's still too much. Uh, but uh, you know, they obviously there's been NATO and there's be all kinds of pacts between countries. You can still do that, but I do think that they have to have self determination in smaller groups. Uh, it just gives if things get too big and too corrupt and too, mm -hmm. too slow to react to things. And and, uh, uh, and it's it's bad for men and women too. I mean, I think in terms of the stuff we were saying, it's like, well, if you have a smaller country, a bigger percentage of the group, that, that group of people is gonna be involved in the protection of that country. Mm -hmm. uh, that's gonna be more a possibility of men having to do that job. And, uh, and so they're gonna be, they're, they're gonna be more involved in the things that they've always been involved in rather than like, oh, well, those guys, mostly from the South, they go fight wars. <laughs> and everybody else, just, you know, everybody just, else just plays with computers, you know? Uh, I think that there's a, there's a more opportunity in a smaller group uh, for more people to do more of the things that men have always done. Yeah, which, which brings me to one, like, one of my big questions I was thinking throughout all of your books was, if you were emperor of the world or you could just have control over everything, how would you redesign society? Like, what is your ideal for the world? Um, like, would we shrink back down to Dunbar's number and have like these 150 <laughs> person tribes? Or? I think we're beyond that. I think, that, you know, I, humanity has come up with a lot of cool things. I mean, I like my, uh, uh, my iPad with the, uh, you know, the new Apple Pencil that I can draw on. I don't have to use paper anymore. I mean, they're, they're, we've done great things uh, by bringing bigger groups that are just survival groups. Uh, but I do think smaller is better, and I do, think, and I think that this past year uh, has really shown that you can have different people in different places do different solutions to different problems, and they have a different result. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can learn a lot from that, rather than like, well, let's get you know, a room full together and make the decision for the whole world, and this is how we're going to go, and uh, it's not necessary. Uh, that's not necessary to, to work on that big of a scale. Uh, so, I, yeah, if I was going to redesign the world, um, yeah, I, I think much smaller countries. Mm -hmm. Much smaller countries is much better. And, uh, I mean, personally, you know, I, as much as I, you know, I'm a conservative in many ways, I, I have real questions about stock markets. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I don't... I think a man should be able to make as much money as he can possibly make in his lifetime. But corporations aren't men, they're things. Right. <laughs> and like, uh, they can just grow and grow and grow and grow and they have no real moral connection to people at all. They're just legal entities. And so, you know, whatever becomes popular is what they're gonna serve. You know, right. it, it, whether the people you know, in that company think it's popular is what they're gonna do. Uh, and uh, I th I'd much rather see one robber baron live out his life, maybe get too big, but then he dies, and then that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. rather than uh, uh, this corporation that can only really ever get bigger and try and make more money somehow, because that's its job. You know, right? and so I, I don't know. I don't know how to solve that. I don't know how you get Apple computers without uh, publicly traded stocks. Yeah. But that, that's, <laughs> That is way outside my lane. Uh, I don't know. 
you know, so like that's some e- economic stuff but I, I do think that it's harmful i'm just not sure how to fix it yeah yeah because i i think it was in your second book you were talking about the empire of nothing basically created by market forces i know it's, we're not going to go in economics but like to, to kind of reclaim masculinity you kind of have to reject abundance like you have to you know, I mean, like, like Genghis Khan's uh, Mongols started to lose battles after they took over China and became rich and stuff. Like, I mean, masculinity only really works in scarcity or it's only like useful in scarcity, it seems. Well, I mean, like I said, I think there's a sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, obviously absolute brutal masculinity is like for killing. We're, we're made to kill each other. Like that's, we're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> we are, our, our fists are in our foreheads are designed to, to kill each other. Uh, and that's, that is what it is. Uh, but I, we don't always have to be doing that. But you know, like I said, that has to be on the table, that that's a possibility. But they, and that's something that, uh, you know, I don't think I've written in any of the books specifically, but I find myself saying a lot, is that if you take violence out of the equation of masculinity, you are no longer talking about the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like, it, 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 like there's this, uh, philosophical thing called the ship of Theseus. And uh, if you take, you know, you know it, it's a question that if you have the ship and it was originally the ship of Theseus, but you know, over time it rots and you have to keep rebuilding it. Like at a certain point, it's not the same ship anymore. Uh, or is it, it's just the idea of the ship or, you know, it, it's certain things. And it's like, what piece, how much of it can you take away? And I think uh, with, in terms of masculinity, if you take away the potential for violence, you are no longer talking about masculinity because mm-hmm. that's that that's part of our that's part of what we are. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody has to kill somebody in their lifetime to be a man. That's not really uh, how society's really ever worked. Uh, but that has to be a possibility. And I think that yeah, if you're if you're not talking, if you're not making some kind of physical potential to make some physical threat ever, uh, I think that that uh, you know, you're, you're just talking about something. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So I have to ask you about paganism uh, before we end, because I, I was very curious. I've heard you mention it here and there. I think you mentioned on some podcasts about getting blood on your regalia. So I was curious if you could speak about your, I mean, actually, I, are you familiar with chaos magic? A little bit. Peter Carroll. Yeah. Cause uh, listening to that, I, I read um, one of his books, uh, Lib or Null in between reading your books. I was like, oh, there's a lot of, a lot of things are, are like synon or um, uh, analogous here with uh psychology and paganism but can you speak a little bit about your spirituality and what you do well yeah i mean uh i started out uh you know, i was kind of more of a hardline atheist when i was younger and then um you know, i joined a group that was you know i was you know, i was going this direction anyway uh you know joined a group that was involved in dramatic paganism and so i had to kind of learn on the fly uh, how to run rituals and do all that because i had to run them for a group uh, and really had no direction on how to do that. And so, uh, you know, I had to kind of figure out my own way to do it. But in terms of what I believe in, in my spirituality, I, I leave it open. Uh, it, something like I said, it, it, you know, obviously I'm writing a book about paganism now, really. I mean, and to me, it's just, you call it polytheism, call it whatever. Uh, you know, you're basically talking about gods that are not like one of the big, you know, uh, big monotheistic gods, you know, whether it's Christianity, Islam, whatever. You're talking about something that's outside of that, where there's more than one God. It's all, that's all pain and really is, right? Uh, and so I'm writing about that, and I, I look at it in terms of architects. Uh, you know, I started writing a book called uh, Odin Thor Frey, based on the Germanic system. And uh, then, you know, I just kind of realized that it was bigger than that. And these ideas have always been around for a really long time. I said, the father in the sky. Well, Odin would be the father in the sky, but we've also had Zeus. And we've also had all these guys that are up there doing this thing. And so that's kind of an idea that's always been around. So, you know, if, if that's not real, what is? You know, this, this, this idea that has never gone away. Um, you know, we just, I just feel like I have given it different names. And same thing with the, you know, the thunderer, the warrior, the striker, uh, that's always been this idealized version of what men are. And, uh, you know, so again, if, if that's not real, what is? Uh, you know, it's, uh, 
it's basically like I, I'm at a point where I'm integrating all these myths uh, because I think that there's a central message to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that's basically what I do. And then, uh, you know, in terms of rituals, uh, I did certain rituals when I was doing uh, rituals for a group of men. And then uh, as I evolved into doing rituals for men who I'd never met, uh, then that, and maybe would, I would never see again, then that, that, the question is what, what, what are they looking for? It's like, what experience are they trying to have? And I, what I really found is that men who maybe don't have Christianity, they don't have some specific religion. They're looking to connect with something that is bigger than them. And they're looking to have some kind of experience that is bigger than them and connect with something that's, you know, bigger than their life, you know, older, eternal, uh, universal. And so that's what they're really looking for. And they, they've, they have an idea of what that is in their head. And if you can connect them to that, you know, that's where I say you, you, you're basically marrying the ideas, uh, you, know, you know, psychology and, and uh, what we think during the day, our philosophy, and then you're taking your unconscious, your dreams, and what, what really makes you passionate, and art and music and all, all, the, all this stuff. Uh, and if you can get them on the same page and moving in the same direction, I think that's really a lot of what ritual is for people, is to, to tap into that unconscious side and then you know, find something like that and, and then move it, get it moving in the same direction. And, and you know, have that kind of ex powerful experience with a uh, you know, sense of something that's older than yourself. So is it fair to say that like the purpose is to summon like dormant traits in yourself? Yeah, I, yeah, really. I, I mean, uh, you know, like I said, these ideas are, are they're idealized versions of uh, masculinity, really, mm -hmm. like different, different roles that men have in life. You know, whether you're the, you know, the father, you're the creator of order, you're you know, the guy who makes rules, or whether you're the protector uh, figure, I mean, that's something that's always part of you. And it's the same thing as, as far as this kind of fertility, you know, it's kind of a, a softer, more natural side of things. I mean, you're, yeah, you're, you're calling that, you're, you're invoking that in yourself. And then there's a, there's a question, and this is actually my Instagram post for today, but uh, it's part, because it's a segment from a new book, but uh, there's kind of a chicken and the egg thing there. Uh, you know, are you summoning the part of yourself that is connected to something divine? Or did we make up the divine to be the best versions of ourselves? Right. And I guess chick which came first, chicken and the egg, it doesn't matter. And, you know, right. like at the end of the day, no one really knows the answer to that. Like maybe there is a, a great father in the sky and like the people who think there isn't are wrong and people who think there are are right. And, uh, but what we can learn from the, that idea has a lot to do with who we are and ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think, yeah, like I said, it doesn't really matter what the answer is, but if you can connect to that, uh, I think that that's something important. Cool, cool. Yeah, the thing I've been getting from like what, what I've been reading about paganism is like, it allows for a lot more freedom of expression like uh, Peter Carroll speaks about monotheism introduced, if there's one God, then there's only one type of good. But paganism is like, well, there's many gods, they all have different personalities and desires that you can kind of choose what fits you, like what God you pledge yourself to. And it just seems more- uh, yeah, What's fun with, uh, especially if you look at like the Greek gods, I mean, uh, they, they add up to all kinds of trouble. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like Zeus is the rapiest God. Uh, <laughs> He's actually everybody all the time, uh, you know. And, but uh, and they, they fight with each other, and they're 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 human in many ways, uh, you know. But they're just kind of better than us, and that's kind of their ideal. It's it's almost like a, I don't want to I don't want to uh, trivialize it, but the, in the way that you know you have people who are sitting in trailer parks look at uh, Hollywood celebrities, you know, like they're like. Oh, they're, they have the same problems as we do. They're just better in every way. <laughs> you know, or at least that's how they think about it. And, 
And in many ways, I think the gods for the Greeks were somewhat like that. Like, what, what are the absolute best versions of ourselves who are still like us, but just mm-hmm. better? Yeah. Every, you know? Cool. Cool. Um, so when's your new book come out? Uh, hopefully in January. Hopefully in January. Okay, I'm soon. Gonna, okay, awesome. Chapter. Okay, awesome. Do you mind sharing the title or does that have to, is that... Uh... Oh, yeah. It's, I, I put it up online and so forth. Uh, the, the okay. title is called Fire in the Dark. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Uh, well, Mr. Donovan, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks so much for being on. This is great. All right, man. No problem. Yeah.